bright and long-lasting pavement markings are an important safety feature on many roads. Highway engineers know that well-maintained markings are the most cost-effective way of providing drivers with continuous delineation of the safe travel path. Successful application of pavement markings takes sophisticated equipment, skilled workers, and high-quality materials. Two-part epoxy pavement marking materials represent one of the latest developments in the area of durable markings. When they're put down correctly, epoxy markings can last for years. In this program on inspecting two-part epoxy pavement marking applications, we'll look at what it takes to produce long-lasting, high-quality pavement markings. We'll begin with a brief overview of the materials and the equipment used in applying epoxy pavement markings. Then, we'll go over your general responsibilities as a pavement marking inspector. And finally, we'll look at 10 major inspection points that are critical for achieving the best pavement marking performance. Okay, let's begin with a look at the materials and equipment used in two-part epoxy applications. First, the epoxy itself. As the name suggests, two-part epoxy consists of two components, part A and part B. The two components must be kept in separate tanks until ready for use. Part A consists of resins and pigments that give the material its bulk and color. Part B is a hardener that, when combined with part A, creates a chemical reaction which changes the material from a liquid to a solid. For pavement markings, the mix ratio of part A to part B is two to one. Unlike regular traffic paint, two-part epoxy contains no solvents or water. For that reason, two-part epoxy is called a 100% solids pavement marking material. When it's correctly mixed and applied, epoxy has tremendous hardness and tensile strength. In fact, one material test for adhesion requires the pavement to fail before the epoxy. But with those advantages come some drawbacks. Epoxy markings have a relatively long no track time, typically from 10 to 20 minutes, but it can take more or less time depending on the temperature. On hot sunny days with low humidity, you'll find the epoxy curing more quickly. On cooler cloudy days or when it's very humid, the lines will take longer to cure. Because of the no track time, epoxy markings usually require protection from traffic until they dry. Coning off the lines is a common protection method. To improve the no track time of epoxy markings, most agencies require the contractor to flood the markings with glass beads. Epoxy markings typically call for 25 pounds of beads per gallon of epoxy, about four times the amount used in regular traffic paint. Of course, the beads have a more important purpose than just promoting quicker no-track. It's the beads that make the pavement markings visible at night through the principle of retroreflectivity. Retroreflectivity is the property that causes beads to reflect light directly back to the source. The light from a vehicle's headlights enters the beads, bounces off the curved back surface, and returns to the driver. Now let's take a look at the equipment used to apply two-part epoxy. Epoxy application equipment is specialized and complex. It must consistently mix the two components in the correct amounts. This diagram shows the mixing process. You have two tanks of material, one containing part A with the resin and pigment, either yellow or white, and the other tank holding part B, the hardener. When the system is operating, both parts are heated briefly as they leave the tanks to make them easier to spray. Then the material enters three material pumps, two for part A and one for part B, to give us the two to one ratio that most formulations call for. The material leaves the pumps and enters a mixing tube under terrific pressure, about 2,000 PSI. Inside the tube is a screw-like device that turns and thoroughly mixes the epoxy components. Finally, the material enters a spray apparatus which shoots it down onto the road. Complete mixing of the components in the correct amounts is the key to good material preparation. Most epoxy edge lines and lane lines are placed with truck-mounted spray guns which can be adjusted to produce the needed line width. 
A bead applicator drops glass beads on the line immediately after it's placed. Markings other than edge and center lines are often applied with hand sprayers. In that case, the beads are usually applied by hand too. Okay, that takes care of the materials and equipment used in two-part epoxy markings. Now let's go over a few of your general responsibilities as a pavement marking inspector. First off, you have to know your references. Part 3 of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices is a good place to start. Part 3 of the manual focuses specifically on pavement marking standards. It provides rules and general guidelines to follow on most applications. It also contains many illustrations of standard marking patterns. You should also be familiar with some of the other documents that govern the marking operation, including the project plans, the special provisions, and the appropriate sections of the standard specifications. In addition, you should review your agency's traffic control requirements for pavement marking operations. The safe maintenance of traffic and the protection of the work crew is every bit as important as getting the lines down in the first place. And don't forget your own protection. When you inspect pavement markings, you're usually without the protection from traffic that you might have on other construction projects. Keep alert and avoid turning your back on oncoming vehicles. Try to minimize the time you spend near open traffic lanes. In preparation for the project, you or your supervisor should take part in the pre-construction conference. Go over the job's requirements with the contractor. Among the items that should be discussed are the materials to be used, especially the type of epoxy and glass beads. All sampling, testing, and approval requirements. The equipment to be used. Weather and temperature restrictions. Pavement preparation requirements. The method of measurement and the basis for payment. And other issues that could affect the outcome of the project. Good communication helps on the job, too. If you see a problem or have a question, don't hesitate to bring it up. It's unfair to wait because any deviation from the plans could mean removing and reapplying a whole new set of markings. On the other hand, you're not there to tell the contractor how to do his job. As long as he uses the right materials and meets the requirements of the contract and short of any serious safety violations, you should allow the operation to continue. And finally, your most important duty, documentation. Thorough documentation of the work provides a written record that can be used to assure accurate payment to the contractor or to show why the payment should be adjusted or withheld. Okay, that takes care of your general responsibilities. Now let's go over 10 key inspection points to cover on every epoxy marking project. Number one, the materials and equipment. Make sure the contractor uses only approved materials, namely the epoxy itself and the glass beads. Check material certifications, stamps or seals, cross-reference batch numbers, and obtain material samples according to your agency's sampling and acceptance procedures. Other typical inspections related to materials include storage. The contractor should take care to protect the epoxy from freezing. Indoor storage may be required. The contractor is also responsible for storing and disposing of empty drums in an environmentally responsible way. Shelf life. Some agencies and manufacturers will place an expiration date on their materials. If it's not used by that date, it should be rejected. Manufacturer. Some agencies have an approved suppliers list. All materials must come from companies on that list. The contractor should not mix epoxy components from different manufacturers in the same batch. Application temperature. You should know the epoxy's maximum or not to exceed temperature. Heating the material beyond that point will usually hurt its performance. You should also check the contractor's supply of glass beads for certification stamps or other sign of approval. The beads should be the size and gradation called for in the specs and should have the specified coating. As for equipment, the plans or specs may specify the type and size of equipment the contractor should use. 
Your agency may require the contractor to calibrate material tanks and gauges. Make sure the documentation of that procedure is available and accurate. See that the contractor has all the required safety equipment. Some typical requirements are truck-mounted crash cushions, aero panels, warning signs, and warning lights. Now, inspection point number two, pavement preparation. Poor pavement preparation is probably responsible for most pavement marking failures. To ensure good performance, make sure the pavement is dry. A simple touch test is adequate for checking pavement dryness. The contract may require complete or partial removal of existing markings. If so, make sure the contractor uses an approved removal method and that it doesn't do significant damage to the pavement. Check the specs and plans to find out how much removal is required and how it's to be measured and paid for. The contractor should sweep or air blast the pavement to remove dust and other road debris to ensure good adhesion to the road surface. This should be done just prior to or along with the striping operation. For placement of epoxy markings on new concrete pavements, the contractor should wait at least 28 days for the concrete to cure. The contractor must also remove any concrete curing compound from the areas to be marked. Epoxy can be installed on new asphalt pavements after 24 hours or so. So, for pavement preparation, remember, the surface must be dry. Old markings must be removed to the specified degree. The surface must be swept or blown clean just before striping. New concrete must be completely cured with all curing compound removed. And wait at least 24 hours before applying epoxy markings on new asphalt. Now, the third inspection point, air and road surface temperature. Although some epoxy formulations can be applied in temperatures as low as 35 degrees, you get the best results when epoxy is applied in temperatures of 50 and above. For one thing, warmer weather helps the epoxy cure faster, so you can let traffic back on sooner. Check the manufacturer's recommendations and your agency's requirements. Make sure that the air and the road surface temperatures meet the minimums before the contractor begins work. The fourth inspection point is checking the layout and pre-marking. Pre-marking is usually required only on new pavements or when a new array of markings is required. It's not necessary for remarking old lines. Sometimes pre-marking is done by the contractor, sometimes by the highway department. In any case, the layout should meet the requirements of the plans and the standards of the MUTCD. Okay, now the fifth point. Material preparation. The key to good material preparation is mixing the two epoxy components in the correct amounts. Again, the typical proportion is two parts part A to one part part B. Check the pressure gauges for each of the three material proportioning pumps. When the system is operating, all three gauges should show equal pressure, which indicates that each pump is sending out the same amount of material. On equal pressure, or a sharp rise and fall of pressure, usually means improper mixing of the epoxy components. Another factor in material preparation is proper heating. Typical recommended application temperature for epoxy is 80 to 160 degrees. Check the material temperature gauges now and then to make sure that the temperature remains in the recommended range. Now, the sixth inspection point. Checking marking alignment and width. Once the work begins, look closely at the quality of the line. The application should follow the pre-marks or the old lines closely. The edges of the marking should be crisp and well-defined. Measure the width of the line. Typical widths are four to six inches for edge lines and lane lines. Wider markings may be used for additional emphasis in hazardous areas. Check the plans for all line widths and notify the contractor when the markings are outside the specified tolerance. On skip lines, check the length of the skips and the spacing in between. A 40-foot cycle is typical. 10-foot skips at 30-foot intervals. Okay, now the seventh inspection point, material thickness. 
Most epoxy markings are applied 15 mils thick, not counting the beads. You can spot check material thickness with a simple plate test. First, secure a thin plate or a piece of tape across the path of the striper to get your sample. You'll have to ask the striper operator to shut off the bead gun as he crosses the plate because the beads will throw off your measurement. After the striper passes, use a wet film thickness gauge or a micrometer to measure the material thickness. You might want to repeat the plate test in a number of locations to get a good average thickness. In addition to the plate test, your agency may also require you to calculate material thickness through the use of one of a number of standard formulas. These formulas are based on the amount of material used, the widths of the lines, and the linear feet covered. In the long run, this is the better method because variables such as truck speed or the settings of the spray gun can affect the results of the plate test. The eighth inspection point is bead distribution and embedment. Because of the large amount of beads used in epoxy pavement markings, they should cover the entire surface of the markings, much like the sand on sandpaper. Ideally, 60% of the bead surface will be embedded in the material. That's enough to anchor them to the line and still provide the required retroreflectivity. The typical bead application rate for epoxy is around 25 pounds of beads to each gallon of epoxy. Make sure that you're getting that rate by comparing the amount of beads applied to the amount of epoxy used throughout the day. Well now, inspection point number nine. Uniform curing. Epoxy pavement markings typically take 10 to 20 minutes to cure enough to let traffic back on them. But curing can take longer or shorter depending on the weather. If the epoxy has been mixed properly, it should cure at about the same rate. Check for uniform curing about half an hour after application. Simply scrape the line every foot or so for 50 feet. If most of the line is hard, but you find occasional soft spots, the epoxy isn't curing uniformly, probably due to an incorrect mix. Notify the contractor immediately. There's a good chance the material pumps aren't working properly. And the test and final inspection is for retroreflectivity. Some agencies use retroreflectometers to take objective measurements of pavement marking brightness. Be sure to follow the manufacturer's directions. They can vary from one instrument to another. Also, brush away any excess glass beads. They can throw off your measurements. Record your results and check them against the specified requirements. The real test of any pavement marking, though, is how well it shows up at night. Drive through the project area at night and look closely at the markings. They should be bright enough that you can see them easily as far as your headlights can shine. Now, let's quickly review the 10 inspection points. First, verify material inspection, approval, or certification. The contractor's equipment should match the job requirements. Make sure the road surface is properly prepared. Clean and dry with all existing markings removed when required by an approved method and to the specified degree. Next, the road and air temperatures. They should meet or exceed those recommended by the epoxy manufacturer or specified in the plans. The contractor's layout and pre-marking should be complete and in close conformance to the plans. Proper material preparation is crucial. The contractor must maintain the proper mix ratio and material temperature. All pressure and temperature gauges should be working and accurate and clearly visible. As the work begins, check to marking alignment and width. Notify the contractor of any problems immediately. Use the plate test as well as the appropriate calculations to check material thickness. Check for adequate bead embedment and distribution. The bead should cover the length and width of the markings and should be firmly anchored in the marking material. Look for uniform curing along a sample of the line. Make sure the markings have achieved a no track condition before traffic is allowed back on. And perform day and night inspections for retroreflectivity. Document all of your inspections, measurements, and observations in your notebook and your daily reports. 
Material used, weather conditions, equipment problems, and test results are just a few of the items to include. When you put all of this together, knowing the requirements, working with a contractor, inspecting critical items, and documenting your actions, the pavement markings you inspect will be around for a long time, keeping the road safer, thanks to you. For additional information and training materials on two-part epoxy and other pavement marking materials, contact the American Traffic Safety Services Association, ATSA, at 5440 Jefferson Davis Highway, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22401. Or you can call us at 703-898-5400.